of the President and Board of the Groton Animal Foundation, I welcome you all. I'm Suzanne Roy Gaff's Education Director. And for those of you who are not Groton residents or who don't know what we do, um, we are a nonprofit organization fueled by grants, donations, and a lot of voluntary hours. Um, our mission is twofold. First, we pay the medical care of the animals at the animal control facility and uh, of pets belonging to Groton residents who have exhausted all other financial resources for emergency veterinary care. Second, we provide educational and supportive programming for our community of pet owners. Last year, we paid for the medical care of 65 animals housed at the Groton Animal Control Facility. We helped 39 families obtain medical care for their pets. And we did a lot more. You can see everything we've been up to on our Facebook page and on our website, grottenanimalfoundation.org. We planned today's event in response to the stories we were hearing from residents who are afraid of coyotes because they don't know if they are gentle or dangerous, or who sadly have witnessed coyotes carrying their small pets away. In Connecticut, and perhaps most states, Animal control officers are frequently called when residents see coyotes for the first time. But the job of an ACO is to manage domestic animals, not wildlife. Therefore, an ACO cannot respond to a coyote call unless a coyote is staggering or exhibiting other symptoms of rabies or illness. We decided to schedule a speaker from the HSUS, the Humane Society of the United States, to teach us about coyotes and to discuss an interesting approach that is gaining favor among coyote-stressed neighborhoods like ours. Immediately following this session, we are hosting a workshop for animal control officers of Eastern Connecticut who will use the training to inform the residents of their jurisdictions. Our focus today is on better understanding the coyote and on learning quick and easy steps that just about anyone can take at any moment in any place to better protect their pets. We're not here to discuss the use of firearms, though this is legal in specific ways defined by a multitude of state and local laws. We aren't qualified to interpret these laws, so we ask you to check with your local police departments for answers to any questions you may have regarding the use of firearms to control coyotes in your neighborhoods. I'm happy to say that this event is being recorded and will be aired on the Groton Municipal TV channel and we will also upload it to our website. We'd like to thank Groton Parks and Rec for the use of the Senior Center, Sean Greeley for recording the event for GMTV, the North End Deli for providing this morning's coffee, and the Bridge Market for supplying box lunches for the ACOs this afternoon. And now I'm thrilled to introduce Lindsay White Dasher, who has flown in from Washington, D.C. to present this program. As Director of Humane Wildlife Conflict Resolution for the Humane Society of the United States, Lindsay helps urban and suburban communities across the country find effective and humane solutions to human wildlife conflicts with species including coyotes, Canada geese, white-tailed deer, and bears. Her experience with coyotes includes completing research and data analysis for the Cook County Coyote Project in Chicago, Illinois, the largest study of urban coyotes in the country. She has also published an analysis of coyote attacks on people throughout the U.S. and Canada. Prior to her work with coyotes, Lindsay completed research on human wolf conflicts for defenders of wildlife and on international human wildlife conflicts for the Bushmeat Crisis Task Force. Lindsay obtained a Master of Science degree in Conservation Biology and Sustainable Development from the University of Maryland in 2006 and a Bachelor of Science degree in Zoology from the Ohio State University in 2002. She has published in the Journal of Mammalogy and in Human Dimensions of Wildlife her publication about changing coyote behavior through hazing at the Wildlife Damage Management Conference was published in 2012. Lindsay has led coyote hazing tra training workshops for animal control and police officers representing more than 150 communities in the United States. And now she can add Groton, Connecticut. Lindsay? Thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, everyone, for coming this morning on an early Saturday morning. I'm happy to see such a nice turnout. Um, I'm happy to be here today in Groton to talk with you about how to prevent conflicts with coyotes. Um, so before I start, though, I always like to start with a, a poll. Uh, how many of you, by a show of hands, have seen a coyote in your neighborhood? <laughs> Almost everyone. Okay, well, that's why you're here then, I'm imagining. Uh, how many of you have had an interaction with a coyote in your pet? A few of you, okay. Um, and how many of you are concerned about that? Yeah, I'd say mostly everyone. Okay, well, I will definitely talk about all of those issues today. What I will cover, I will start with a basic background in coyote ecology and behavior. I'll talk about why we have coyotes here in Groton. I'll talk about how to solve coyote conflicts. Um, just as a preview, that will involve changing problematic coyote behavior, of course, uh, but it'll also involve changing some of our behaviors. I'll talk about how, what to do if you see a coyote in your neighborhood, uh, which you probably will since you already have. I'll talk about how to protect your pets, how to protect yourselves, and just in general, how to change uh, coyote behavior and also give some tips for coexistence. I always like to start with a basic background in coyote ecology and behavior, um, not just because it's interesting to learn more about coyotes, but because if we want to change the problematic behavior of coyotes, we have to learn how to think like a coyote. So we need to understand a little bit about why they do what they do. So Pretty much everyone says that you've seen a coyote, so I imagine you already know what they look like. Uh, but for those of you that don't, they look like this. Um, they, are, they are generally much smaller than they, are, than they appear. Um, generally, they are about 25 to 35 pounds in this area. They might be a little bit larger. Uh, they could be up to about 40 pounds, but they look a lot bigger than they actually are. And that's because of their big bushy coats and their long legs. Uh, they have these big pointed ears, these striking yellow eyes. Those are two, that's a way to differentiate them from a domestic dog is those yellow eyes. And also their tails, which they keep pointed downward. Uh, to tell the difference between them and a red fox, for example, another animal that's common in urban areas, uh, first of all, a red fox is much smaller. It's about half the size. Um, but also, you can look at the tail. So coyotes have a black-tipped tail, whereas red foxes have a white-tipped tail. They, uh, you may also see signs of coyotes, even if you're not actually seeing the coyote itself. So you might see coyote scat. Coyotes actually help mark their territory by leaving scat along certain pathways. Um, if you see it, it actually looks very similar to dog scat, but it often has um, fur inside. You'll see from, from the animals that they're eating, which, which mostly are rodents, like mice and rats. You might see the tracks. The tracks also look similar to dog tracks, uh, except for a couple differences. If you can see the claw marks, usually dog tracks, you can see all four of the claw marks, whereas with coyotes, usually you only see the two uh, innermost claw marks. Also, if you can see the whole pattern of tracks, that's a way to tell. Coyote tracks are typically going in a very straight line. They're usually moving in a very determined straight line. Whereas dogs, um, especially if they're like my dog, sort of meander all about, you know, sniffing this thing and that thing. Uh, or you might hear coyotes. How many of you can hear coyotes howling where you live? Lucky. I wish I could hear that. Uh, so coyotes make a lot of different noises. They don't just howl. They also bark and yip and whine. And um, the, a couple of coyotes can actually sound like a group of 10 or 20 coyotes. Uh, because they make many different noises, they can even throw their voices around. And they do this on purpose, because one of the primary reasons that coyotes howl is to defend their territory from other coyotes. So they make all of these noises. They want to sound like a bigger group than they actually are, because they want to keep other coyotes away. Uh, so I often hear from people that say they can hear coyotes howling, and that you know there's, there's 20 or 30 of them out there behind their house, when in reality, there's probably only two or three or four. They're just sounding like they're much, you know, a much bigger group than they actually are. Uh, but coyotes make noises for other reasons, too. They uh, howl to communicate with their family members and their pups. So especially this time of year, when the pups are born, you probably will hear more vocalizations as they're communicating with their pups. 
They will also, um, howl if you live near a police station or a fire station, they will also howl back at sirens. We, we don't know why that is, but there actually was a researcher working out of Ohio State University who was trying to study the howling of coyotes, and she was playing recordings of coyote, coyote howls, trying to get the coyotes to howl back so that she could um, take some notes, and it wasn't working very well. Um, but she noticed after a while that every time a police car or an ambulance went by with a siren on, they would howl back. So she finally just started playing recordings of sirens, and that worked much better uh, to get them to respond. Uh, one reason that they do not howl, though, and this is a common misconception, um, is to defend or because they've made a kill. So a lot of people um, think that coyotes are, are howling because they're celebrating a kill. Um, and that you know, makes it a scary sound. But, but they're not doing this um, for a couple of reasons. One is that coyotes actually do not hunt in packs. They hunt on their own. They're mostly hunting very small animals like mice and rats. So that's not an animal that they need an entire pack to take down. And secondly, even if they were to um, take down a large prey item, you know, they wouldn't want to be making a lot of noise to let other animals know that they had this item. So if you hear coyotes howling, it's not because they've killed a pet and they're celebrating their kill. Um, it's because they're either defending their territory, you know, telling other coyotes to stay away, or it could be communicating with their other uh, family members and pups. Okay, so coyotes are actually originally native to the central part of North America, and they uh, sort of were evolved in this grassland type habitat, but they really now can live everywhere in every type of habitat. As I mentioned, they have these nice long legs that allow them to run really fast. So they are actually the third fastest land mammal in North America. Uh, the first and second are the pronghorn antelope and then the mountain lion. They're very fast. They're extremely intelligent and adaptable. They can fit into pretty much any environment. They can learn very quickly. They learn how to cross. Um, they learn, they've actually found in the Chicago area, they've seen them learning how to um, follow traffic, you know, learn traffic lights and use those to cross the road. We've seen them crossing highways. You know, they learn when you take your trash out. You know, they learn, they learn a lot, which allows them to be very successful. Um, you know, so if any of you or your kids or your grandkids watch those, you know, Roadrunner Wile E. Coyote cartoons, those are incredibly inaccurate and unfair to the coyote. Um, in real life, coyotes are very smart. They would never keep buying those stupid acne products and falling for them over and over again. Um, they actually learn very quickly and catch on very quickly. Um, another reason why coyotes are so successful is that they will eat pretty much everything. Uh, they're actually not true carnivores. They're what we call opportunistic omnivores, which again means they'll eat just about anything. So if it's a bad year and there are less rabbits or you know less mice, they can just switch to something else. Um, they also will scavenge. They'll eat dead animals. So you might see if there's a, a deer that has been killed on the side of the road, they might scavenge on that. Uh, but primarily what they are eating, um, again, are rodents like mice and rats. So you know they really are doing us a service in urban and suburban areas by helping to control the rodent population in that regard. They do eat some um, white-tailed deer fawns. They, we, they don't, eat, they don't um, hunt adult deer very often, but they do uh, sometimes hunt fawns. Uh, they also eat a lot of fruit. And this is uh, another surprising statistic to a lot of people. Um, in urban areas, so this is in the Chicago area, uh, about a quarter of their diet was fruit. Um, in more southern parts of the country, they, up to half of their diet is fruit. So if you have fruit trees and the fruit has fallen on the ground, that actually is an attractant to coyotes to come into your neighborhood or your yard. Um, they eat a variety of other things. Um, I always like to point out these statistics. So these numbers here are from the Chicago area, from uh, the Cook County Coyote Project, which as uh, Suzanne mentioned in the beginning in my, in my introduction, this is the largest study of urban coyotes in the country, actually in the world. They have radio collared about 1,000 coyotes. They've been doing this for over, well, 15 years at this point. They have a lot of information about how coyotes live in you know, the greater Chicago metropolitan area, you know, one of the biggest cities in the country. And so these, these statistics came from there. 
and only 2% of their food, you know, their scat showed remains of human associated food. And that would include um, garbage, pet food, that sort of thing. Um, only 1% showed the remains of a pet, and that was a domestic cat. Um, and so what a, you know, the reason I share this is because you know, anytime a coyote attacks a pet, um, it is, of course, a very tragic event, and we definitely want to make sure that those events don't happen. Um, but they also get a lot of media attention. We hear about them a lot. But the truth is that the vast majority of coyotes are not bothering people and pets. Um, the vast majority of coyotes are eating these other sources of food. Um, it's a very small number that are, um, that are attacking pets. Okay, in terms of the social structure for coyotes, there are two different types. There are the resident coyotes. These are the ones that we typically think of. They live in family groups with one breeding pair and then the pups of the year. They uh, do actively defend their territories from other coyote family groups. And then we have transient coyotes. So these are coyotes that are solitary, they're out there on their own, they're usually younger coyotes that are looking for a mate and looking to um, start their own family group and start their own home range. So they, um, they have larger overlapping home ranges because they're not able to defend their territory. And essentially they are just looking for a home range to open up, you know, so that they can move in. Okay, there are three seasons for coyotes and they all have different possible um, implications for potential conflicts with, with people and pets. So the first one is mating season, and that is from December through March. This, of course, is when coyotes are mating with each other. Again, only one um, mating pair per group of coyotes will actually be mating, just one female in the group. Coyotes are actually truly monogamous. They are one of the only mammals that actually really are truly monogamous. Once they find a mate, they will stay together for life. And not just that, but they, um, they we, so researchers have found by looking at DNA and, and following the radio collared coyotes in Chicago, they found no instances of cheating amongst these pairs either, um, which is very rare. And uh, Stan Garrett is the head of the Cook County Coyote Project. He has also said, he's said this often in the news, that he's never documented a case of divorce amongst coyotes in the wild either. You know, so they really do stay together. If one of them dies, the other one will find another mate. But they really do stay together and they have a very strong bond. And we think that one of the reasons for this is that it's very important that both the male and the female are involved in raising the pups. They both take a very active role. Um, so because they're so monogamous and so committed to each other, they're also, the males are also very territorial of their mate. So if a male coyote thinks that a large dog is getting too close to his mate, he might um, try to defend, you know, defend his mate. So we do, even though coyote attacks on large dogs are, are very, pretty rare, uh, we do sometimes see them, when we see them, it's usually this time of year. And it's almost always an off-leash dog that has gotten too close to a coyote's mate. Okay, then pup rearing season, that's what we're in now. This, of course, is when the pups are born. Um, this is the only time of year that coyotes use a den. Um, a lot of people think that coyotes use a den all year long. They're looking for the den, trying to figure out where it is, but the rest of the year, coyotes don't use a den. They just they sleep wherever. It could be a different place every night or every day. Um, but this time of year, when the pups are small, until the pups are about six weeks old, then they will put their pups in a den. Um, so this time of year, as you can imagine, sometimes we do see conflicts um, with parents that are trying to defend their den, or also coyotes are needing to hunt extra um, to feed their pups. So sometimes we do see conflicts with pets during this time of year. So um, sometimes we will see conflicts again with off-leash dogs uh, that get very close to a coyote's den and they might try to, there might be an interaction between the coyote and the dog trying to defend the den. Uh, we don't see that very often though because coyotes are actually uh, very passive. They are much more likely to move their den somewhere else. They'll move their pups sometimes two to three times over the season um, rather than try to confront um, a problem. Uh, but sometimes we do see conflicts with small unattended pets. So as I mentioned, coyotes are, they're out, they need to hunt extra to feed their pups. So we often will see more sightings of them during the daytime this time of year, just because they're spending more time hunting to get food. Um, but they also will sometimes view um, unattended small pets. So that would be free roaming cats 
or it would be small unattended dogs. So those would be, by unattended I mean that the dog is not on a leash um, or that the dog is unattended in a backyard. So coyotes do view these small unattended animals as potential prey items. Um, they don't really see a difference between a cat or an unattended dog um, than a woodchuck or a rabbit, for instance. It looks like a fair prey item. Now, if you were there with a dog and the dog is on a leash, that's a different story. Uh, but these unattended uh, pets do look like prey items to a coyote. So sometimes when they're needing to feed their pups, we do see more instances of pet attacks on unattended pets this time of year. And I'll talk more a little bit later on about what we can do about that. Okay, the last season, dispersal season, that's from September through December. This is when the yearling coyotes from the year before sort of get kicked out of the group. They go off and form their own uh, family groups. And, you know, we typically see less conflicts this time of year. But sometimes we see conflicts with these, these younger, um, they're often younger, inexperienced males. They're not as great at hunting yet. If people are leaving easy sources of food, like pet food outside, they might take advantage of that. So sometimes we see those sorts of things. Okay, in terms of where they can live, uh, coyotes can really live just about everywhere. Um, they, you know, they don't need to have a nice forested, you know, forest preserve, although they love that. But they can live, you know, in a cemetery. They can live right next to a shopping mall. They can really live just about everywhere. And most of the time, people have no idea that they're even there. Um, have any of you seen this picture before? Okay. So this is a, uh, this is, this was a, this is a Snapple cooler from uh, inside a Quiznos sub shop in downtown Chicago. So this was in the heart of downtown Chicago. This was a few years ago. And it was a warm spring day, and the employees had left the door open to get a breeze in. Uh, it was the middle of the day, and this coyote just wandered in off the street, uh, tried to jump over the, uh, over the sandwich counter, uh, didn't make it, settled into the Snapple cooler, and just sat there like this for, I don't know, 10 minutes or so um, while before animal control came to get him. And some of the people in the store, you know, kept eating their sandwiches and were taking pictures. Um, and of course, you know, the news, you know, teams got there right away. It was a huge story in the five o'clock news. And um, what I find most interesting about this is not just, you know, this funny picture that I have to show you, but it was the public's reaction to it. So people were getting interviewed by the, the news team, and uh, what people kept saying over and over again was, you know, why in the world is there a coyote here in downtown Chicago? You know, we don't have coyotes in downtown Chicago. But the truth is there are a lot of coyotes in downtown Chicago. When they review the footage of the traffic cameras at night, in the middle of the night, they see coyotes tr crossing the streets all the time. Um, they're everywhere, um, but they're just, most of them are not doing this, so people have no idea that they're there. You know, when I, um, I got to go ride around in the truck that follows the radio collared coyotes around in Chicago, um, I was very excited because most of my time I was just sitting in a desk in a windowless cubicle, you know, analyzing GIS data. And it was very boring. And one night I got to go out in the truck and I was very excited because I'd never seen a coyote before. And I thought, definitely going to see a coyote tonight. Uh, we zoomed in on three different radio collared coyotes. We got within um, probably 30 feet of them. I never saw one the whole time. Even when we knew exactly where they were, because they're so good at hiding. And they were right within a housing subdevelopment. They were right next to a shopping mall. They were right next to a highway. Um, and you know, so you know, most of the time, people have no idea that they're there. Obviously, you all have seen the coyotes in your neighborhood, but I bet a lot of your neighbors probably don't even know that they're there. So, you know, coyotes really do go out of their way to avoid people. Uh, and they become more nocturnal in urban areas. You know, they learn our habits, and most of the time they use that to avoid us. Uh, just a little bit, people, a lot of people like to know a little bit about mortality and disease. Coyotes can live in captivity, about the same lifespan as a large domestic dog. But in urban areas, the, they only have an average lifespan of three years old. The biggest source of mortality are our cars. So even though they do pretty good at crossing streets, you know, still, uh, cars are the biggest source of mortality. Mange is a disease caused by a mite that causes them to lose their hair. And, um, and especially in places like this where you can have harsh winters, you know, that makes them weaker, not as good at hunting, and then they, they you know, perish during the winter time. Rabies is, is very rare. Now I know, interestingly, um, if you've been hearing on the news, there have been a few cases in New Jersey lately um, of some rabid coyotes. And I, I'm not quite sure why that is going on, but um, overall, 
rabies in coyotes is, is very rare. We very rarely see it. Okay, so why do we have coyotes here in Groton? Well, uh, number one, you have plenty of habitat. As I mentioned, they're not picky. Um, they will live anywhere, pretty much. There's plenty of food, plenty of mice and rats, you know, plenty of other small mammals. They're actually helping control the rodent population, helping to control disease. Uh, they're also a primary predator of Canada goose eggs. So if you have too many Canada geese, I know a lot of places in Connecticut have that issue. They, they really do help control the population of Canada geese. Uh, so they're, you know, they're helping us in those ways. Another big reason, though, is that there's really no competition for them. You know, we really don't have wolves or bears or mountain lions in urban areas. Um, so they really are, you know, they're literally the top dog. Uh, so there's plenty for coyotes to eat without ever bothering our pets or our garbage. But, you know, coyotes are very smart. They're going to eat whatever is easiest to eat. So if we're leaving these easy sources of food outside, like pet food or unsecured garbage cans or, you know, as I mentioned, fruit uh, from fruit trees or gardens, you know, those coyotes will take advantage of that. Um, bird feeders, you know, if you have a bird feeder and there's a lot of bird seeds spilled on the ground, uh, they don't eat the bird seed, but that can attract rodents that can attract them. As I mentioned, unattended small pets can be an attractant, but the ultimate, of course, is intentional feeding. So hopefully no one in your neighborhood or that you know is purposely feeding a, a coyote, or even worse yet, hand feeding a, co a coyote. That is the easiest way to lead towards um, conflicts with coyotes, or, or really any wildlife. Um, but, you know, people might not be purposely feeding coyotes. They might be leaving food out for squirrels or, or cats or some other animal. But that doesn't matter to coyotes. They will come eat it anyway. So, you know, the number one best way to prevent and solve conflicts with coyotes is to reduce these attractants as much as possible um, because that really is the biggest source of conflicts. Okay, so in terms of preventing conflicts with coyotes, um, just number one, is, is, if you see a coyote, is that a conflict? Um, almost all of you said that you have seen a coyote. So what does that mean? Well, number one, coyotes are naturally diurnal, which means they're most active at dawn and dusk. They do often switch to a more nocturnal uh, lifestyle in urban and suburban areas to avoid us. But it's perfectly natural to see them out during the day, especially during pup season when they are hunting extra to feed their pups. So seeing them during the day doesn't mean that they're rabid or aggressive. Um, it just means it's, it's normal. Um, however, you know, they should run away from you. If they see you, they should run away from you. Coyotes are naturally afraid of people. Um, if they don't run away from you when you see them, they are probably what we call habituated, which essentially means that they've lost their fear of people. And to some extent, all coyotes are habituated to us. But um, sometimes they just lose that fear of people. They don't run away from us. They might even approach us. Um, if a coyote is approaching you, that's probably a very sure sign that someone has been feeding that coyote. But how does this happen? How do coyotes become habituated? Well, first of all, uh, usually it's because they learned that neighborhoods are a source, an easy source of food. And they also learned that nothing bad happens to them when they come into neighborhoods and eat this source of food. Um, and, you know, without realizing it, we actually have taught coyotes to be habituated. So every time we see a coyote and we don't react, we are teaching them that it's perfectly fine for them to come into our neighborhood and perfectly fine to come up onto our porches and eat our dog food. Um, you know, I won't ask any of you, put you on the spot and ask you what you did when you saw a coyote, but I'll tell you what I did the first time I finally saw a coyote. Um, I was very excited and I stood there and I just watched him. And if I had a camera, I probably would have taken a picture. This is before I knew about all this. Um, but what was I teaching that coyote? I was teaching him that he's perfectly welcome here. Just continue doing whatever you're doing. So if that's what you did, um, that's what you were teaching that coyote. Um, or worse yet, if you ran away, you were teaching him not only are you welcome here, but I'm afraid of you. So um, that's what we want to avoid. Um, at the same time, you know, when you interact with a coyote, you actually are not, you're always teaching them, first of all. Second of all, you are teaching their entire family group because uh, coyotes are very social. If one coyote learns they can come into a neighborhood and eat pet food and nothing bad happens, they will share that information with the rest of their family group. Um, and pretty soon, you might start having three coyotes in your neighborhood. Do any of you have that? Um, and it's because that information spreads. 
Um, the good news, though, is that we can take advantage of that and reverse that behavior, which is what we'll talk about when we get to hazing. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, coyotes normally will hunt small rodents. They normally leave pets alone, but as I mentioned, they do sometimes um, attack unattended pets. So unattended, as I mentioned, that, that means a pet is not on a leash or it is, you know, uh, in a backyard where there's not a person there with them. So again, these animals look like fair prey to a coyote. Um, so unattended pets are at risk of being attacked by a coyote. Um, however, that does not mean that, um, it, okay, if a coyote has attacked an atten unattended pet, that does not mean they're going to next attack a person. So I hear that a lot. You know, coyotes have attacked um, cats or small dogs, and then people are concerned that because of that, they're going to start, you know, going after kids, you know, my kids and my grandkids. Um, but those are just two completely different things. Coyotes know the difference between kids and, and small pets. Um, however, small pets, again, do look like fair prey items. As I mentioned, larger dogs, typically not as much at risk, but especially if they are off leash, sometimes during breeding season and maybe during pup season, they can be at risk. So what do we do about this? Well, of course, the best way is to make sure that you're always with your pet and that the pet is on a leash and preferably a leash that's six feet long or less. You know, that way you are with the coyote, the coyote sees you, they should be afraid of you, and then they will um, avoid your pet. Uh, so, you know, we would never recommend letting your pet outside unattended uh, any time of day. As I mentioned, coyotes are out during the day, um, but especially at night. If you see a coyote and you are with your pet, if it's a small pet, we'd recommend picking them up. If it's a larger pet, we recommend, you know, pulling them in and sort of putting them behind you if you can so that you can get the coyote to focus on you and scare them away. Don't ever allow your dogs to play with coyotes. I think that goes without saying, but um, I have known people that have done this. It might look like fun at first, but you know, dogs don't understand coyote body language and it can get aggressive pretty quickly. So um, in summary, with small dogs, you wanna make sure you're always with them. Large dogs be extra vigilant during that breeding season. Make sure they're always on a leash. Uh, now moving on to cats. So. Unfortunately, the only way to make sure that your cat is safe, um, and not just safe from coyotes, but from other wildlife, from cars, from disease, um, and also to protect other wildlife from harm by your cat, is to make sure that you keep them inside. Uh, Humane Society of the United States definitely recommends keeping your cats inside all the time. We have a great resource, humanesociety.org slash indoor cats, where you can get a lot of great information about how to transition your cat to the indoors um, and still provide them with a lot of, you know, stimulation. However, you can let your cat enjoy the outside. Uh, you can use a leash and a harness. Um, everybody laughs at this thought, but I actually do this with my cats. I take them out in the backyard uh, with a leash and a harness. And I'm not trying to walk them around, of course, because they're cats and they, you know, they don't cooperate. But they can lay in the grass and roll around and they chew on the grass and, you know, then they come inside later and throw it up everywhere. But um, at least they get the enjoyment of the outside and I know that they're safe, um, even though my neighbors think that I'm nuts. Uh, so that's one way. Another way you can use a cat enclo enclosure. You know, this is not coyote proof, so you wouldn't want to put your cat in it and then, you know, go to work for the day. But if you're outside with a cat, this is something that you could do. Uh, my cat did not like this, but yours might. Or, of course, the ultimate is the catio, sort of the newly emerging trend in um, cat accessories. So this is a completely enclosed coyote proof area where often the cat can access from, from the inside. They can go out and have this wonderful space. I'm still trying to talk my husband into this one, yet I think it's wonderful. Okay, so as I mentioned, you know, those are really the only ways to make sure your cat is safe. Um, if for whatever reason you, you know, are, are going to continue to let your cat outside, or if you help care for a feral cat colony, you know, you first of all must understand there is a risk. Um, but secondly, there are some things you can do to decrease the risk somewhat. Uh, the most important one is to make sure you're not leaving cat food outside because the cat food will attract coyotes in and then that can endanger your cat. So uh, if it's a pet cat, we definitely recommend feeding them inside. If it is, uh, if they're a feral cat colony, for example, we recommend just putting the food out once per day and staying there until the cats eat and then removing it. 
and you know the cats will catch on pretty quickly uh, how this works. You can also provide some escape routes or shelters or places that they can go. Okay, so if I haven't said it enough, enough times, the best way to protect your pets is to make sure that you're always with them and that they're on a leash. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about fences and yards because coyotes can jump over six foot tall fences and anything less. So if you are letting your pet outside um, in, and your fence is six feet tall or less, unless you have done something to it, which I'll explain in a moment, uh, you should know that your pet is considered an unattended pet in that case. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you either uh, make your fence coyote proof or that you're outside with them, you know, especially if it's a smaller pet. Uh, so I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. You also might want to consider removing some of the, or thinning up some of the brush that provides hiding places for coyotes. Uh, you always want to look around, not just your yard, but your neighbor's yards. You know, see if you have these sorts of, these types of food attractants and talk to them about how, you know, they could perhaps reduce those. Uh, motion activated sprinklers are, I don't have a lot of good data on how well those work for coyotes, but I know they work pretty well for geese and deer and rabbits. Um, they could also work for coyotes. Okay, so these are just some, some photos to sort of share a little bit about um, some of what I was talking about. So if you can imagine that this was, you know, someone's yard, and this is a little four foot tall chain link fence, which is not going to deter a coyote whatsoever. And here is all this great hiding place for a coyote. So let's imagine, and this is actually a very typical story. Let's imagine that the owner uh, lets his dog outside every morning at 6 a.m. You know, it's a little dog. The dog, you know, runs, roams around. The guy goes back inside, has his coffee and his newspaper, and, you know, lets the dog back in, you know, 10, 15 minutes later. He's been doing this every day for years and without a problem. And all of a sudden, one morning, he lets the dog outside. You know, it's only been a minute and he hears something, goes outside, and there's a coyote running over the fence with his dog in his mouth. And it sounds like this happened very suddenly. But the truth is that coyotes know everything that's going on in their home range. They know all of the dogs. They know, you know, if you walk your dog every day at the same time, they know that. And for the most part, they use that to avoid you. But especially during pup season, when they need to, you know, hunt more to feed their pups, they might use that information, you know, in a negative way. So um, coyotes are also ambush predators. So there's all this hiding place, hiding places for the coyote to be waiting. Um, and then so, you know, as soon as the man goes back inside, the coyote can jump over the fence and get the dog. So, you know, this similar sort of yard, I still have this fence that's not going to provide any protection, but at least there's not all of these hiding places for the coyote to be waiting. So uh, of course we don't recommend you know we don't recommend that you remove all of your vegetation from your yard because that's good for the planet and wildlife but you can trim up underneath a bit or thin it out a bit just so that you can see that there's not uh, any coyotes hiding and waiting there um, but of course if you have a fence like this we would recommend that you be out there with your dog or at least watching okay so a six foot fence as I mentioned coyotes can jump over unless you do something to the top of it so this uh, yeah, I, know, I admit is not the most attractive option but it is an inexpensive way to keep coyotes from jumping over uh, this is a better option it's called a coyote roller you can get it on coyoteroller.com uh, essentially what it is is a very loosely rolling bar that attaches to the top of a fence so again, the fence must at least be six feet tall for this to work, um, because it, a fence that is less than six feet tall, coyotes just jump right over. If it's six feet tall, what they do is they jump up on top and they get a foothold and push themselves over. So what this roller does, it's a very loosely rolling, they can't get the foothold, they get rolled backwards. So it keeps them from getting over the fence. It also, if you have a dog that you know is a, an escape artist and is always getting out of the fence, this will also keep your dog in the fence. So these are great. Um, you can get them in different colors to match your fence. Uh, they can be potentially pricey if you have a big fence, but you can do a make it your own version with getting some PVC piping and just rolling it very loosely. Okay, so moving on to attacks on people. Often when there are pet attacks, people's minds go to this, understandably. You know, do cry, are coyotes going to bite me or my children? Um, and the truth is these instances are very rare. I did research all of the cases I could find of coyotes biting people through the United States and Canada and published a paper on it, and we found an average of less than 10 bites a year. 
Uh, compared to the number of dog bites, which are almost 5 million in the U.S. alone every year, it's a very small number. Most involve very minor injuries. Uh, just as many adults were bitten as children, uh, you know, a lot of people think that coyotes are coming after kids, but we found, you know, just as many adults were bitten. They're usually single bites to the extremities. In the cases where we had good information, um, most of them were feeding or pet related. So feeding would be, could be a person directly was feeding a coyote at the time, or someone else was, or it could be that a neighbor or someone else was feeding the coyote. Pet related would also include examples where someone came outside and saw that a coyote was attacking their pet, tried to get the pet back, and was bitten that way. Um, cases where people were bitten by rabid coyotes are very, very few. It's a very small percentage. So again, the, you know, the attacks that just happened in New Jersey is, is a very rare case. Um, usually we find that is not the reason, uh, which is the opposite from wolves, for example. Most attacks um, on people by wolves, they're almost all caused by rabid or, or sick wolves. But with coyotes, it's almost always healthy coyotes that have been fed by people. So, you know, these are, so the, the good news is these are much more preventable because we just need to make sure people are not feeding coyotes. Uh, one very obvious example was a McDonald's restaurant in the Colorado area where employees had been feeding a coyote french fries through the drive-in window. Yeah, it sounds funny until one day an elderly woman pulled up, you know, to the drive-in window to get her food and a coyote came up to her window and she didn't feed him any french fries and she got bitten. And, you know, and there are other cases in Colorado of people on ski resorts who see coyotes and they think it's fun to feed them, you know, and then other people come along and they get bitten. So we do see a lot of these cases we think really are because people are feeding them. So, you know, whenever these happen, of course, we want to get as much information as possible about what happened so that we can prevent it from happening again. But, um, oh, because I'm in Connecticut, I also have to share one other story. Um, did anyone hear about a coyote attack in Bethany, Connecticut a few years ago? Okay. Uh, it made the headlines. This woman was attacked by a coyote in Bethany, Connecticut. Um, and I use this example when I give my, my talk to um, animal control officers. Um, it turns out she wasn't attacked by coyotes. Um, she w had been hearing a lot about coyotes and was so concerned about them on the news that she was jogging and she thought she saw one. And um, she fell into a briar bush. And what happened was there never was a coyote. Um, she just fell into a briar bush, and that is what happened. So if you heard about that one, I just want you to know that didn't actually happen. Um, but they do happen sometimes, but the truth is they're very rare. So you're actually more likely to be killed by a champagne cork or a golf ball than you are to be bitten by a coyote. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. And steer clear of briar bushes as well. Okay, so in terms of kids, kids are not any more likely to be bitten by coyotes than adults. Um, however, we should teach kids some tips. Um, I think it's great to have educational programs that teach kids what coyotes look like and what to do if they see a coyote. But, you know, since kids are actually much, many, many more times more likely to be bitten by a domestic dog than a coyote, I think a, a better approach is just to teach kids to never approach or feed or pet any animal um, unless an adult says it's okay first. So I think that's the best way to go. The kids, if they see a coyote, they should um, put their arms up in the air, look big and loud. Um, they can back away slowly. Um, hopefully young kids are, are not unattended in a yard anyway, but they can yell for an adult. Um, but the one important thing is they should never run away from a coyote. And that's true for, for adults as well. Um, you should never run away from a coyote or any predator, like a mountain lion or a bear uh, or a wolf, because if you do that, that can initiate their predatory chasing behavior. So we want to make sure we never run away from them. OK, so when we have these conflicts going on, what do we do about them? Well, we have to change the problematic coyote behavior, of course. But we do also have to change some of our behaviors that lead to it. So you know, changing our behaviors is really what I've been talking about so far, looking around, talking to our neighbors, eliminating any food attractants, taking precautions with our pets, talking to our kids. Um, but how do we change the coyote behavior? That's where we have you know, a few more uh, options. The traditional approach has been to remove coyotes, either on a large scale or, or an individual scale. There's relocation, moving them somewhere else, 
or there's hazing, which is essentially a way of training them to change their behavior. So relocation often sounds like a great idea. You know, we don't want to kill the coyotes, but we don't want them in our neighborhood, so let's just pick them up and move them somewhere else where they can live happily ever after. The problem is that um, there really is nowhere that we can move coyotes to that coyotes aren't already in. Um, pretty much coyotes are everywhere. They're just everywhere. They're in every state in the U.S. except Hawaii. They're in every major city. They're everywhere. And if you pick up coyotes and put them somewhere else, the coyotes that already live there are not going to appreciate it. They're going to get in a scuffle. They're going to kick the new coyotes out. Sometimes the new coyotes get killed that way. The new coyotes also, uh, the relocated coyotes, are very territorial. They're just going to do whatever they can to get back home. So they're not going to stay where you put them. Um, a lot of times they actually get killed trying to get back home. You know, they could also cause more conflicts wherever you stuck them while they're trying to get back home. They're not familiar with the area. So it doesn't work. Um, and, you know, a lot of people want this because they think it's more humane, for example, than killing them. But it actually can be less humane because these animals are very stressed and a lot of times they end up dying anyway. And so there's a lot of, of money and resources involved in it. It's also usually prohibited because ra uh, coyotes are a rabies vector species, just like all mammals, and usually can't move them around within a state because of that. So unfortunately, this, this is not an option. Um, so lethal removal has sort of been the traditional approach. Um, our USDA Wildlife Services program kills 80,000 coyotes per year. They've been doing that for hundreds of years. Um, but it just doesn't work. And um, one easy way to tell this is that we have more coyotes now than we ever have before. As I mentioned, you know, they used to be limited to the central part of the U.S. Now they are all across the U.S., except for Hawaii and every major city. We have more coyotes than we ever had before. And one of the reasons for that is that coyotes are really set up to repopulate. Um, and it has a lot to do with their social structure. As I mentioned, coyotes live in family groups with just one breeding female. What happens is, if that group is disrupted because one or more of the coyotes are killed, the group will split up, and all the females will go off and for their, form their own groups and start breeding. So whereas you only had one female per group breeding before, now you have all the females breeding. Also, once you reduce the population a bit, um, there will be more resources left over in the environment for the remaining coyotes. And that allows them to have larger litters of pups and allows their pups greater chance of survival. So you have more females having more pups with a greater chance of survival, and you see how pretty quickly uh, what often happens after these removal programs is you end up with more coyotes than you started with. Um, also, any time that you remove a coyote, you are opening up a home range. And remember all of those transient coyotes that are floating around out there looking for a new home range? They're going to move right in and then they're gonna start having pups. So, you know, there's just a lot of reasons why this approach doesn't work. And even professional coyote trappers will often say, you know, this approach does not work to reduce the coyote population. Uh, there even have been studies to try to document, you know, how many coyotes do you have to remove? There was a study in Colorado where they took 92 coyotes. They put, they put them into two groups, a control group that they left alone, and then another group which uh, in this group, every year for seven years, they killed 61 to 75 percent of the coyotes. Every year for seven years. And then after that time, they stopped, waited to see what would happen. And within just eight months, the population was back up to where they started in the first place. And that's because the, the pups, you know, the litters of pups doubled. The females started breeding at an earlier age. Interestingly, they started having more female pups than male pups. And so very quickly that went back. So if you can imagine, you know, all of the time and resources that would go into removing 75% of the coyotes here in Groton, if you did that and then within eight months you were back up to where you started, you know, I don't think many of you would consider that a good return on your investment. So this approach just does not work. So a better approach is instead of just trying to reduce the coyote population, uh, another approach is to just find the particular coyote that's causing the problem, attacking pets or coming into neighborhoods and removing that coyote. And clearly that is um, a better approach, a more strategic, effective, you know, even humane approach. Um, but one of the problems with that is that it's very difficult to do. So in urban areas, um, often, um, especially, you know, in, in 
very urban areas, discharging firearms is often not a safe option. So often what is used are traps. And so these traps are put out, and traps by nature are fairly indiscriminate. So for every trap that you put out to catch a coyote, uh, coyotes are, it's very difficult to get a coyote to go into a trap because they're very smart and wary of human scent. Um, so often for every trap that you put out to catch a coyote, you'll catch dozens of opossums and raccoons and potentially even domestic pets. It's very hard to get any coyote to go into a trap, let alone the particular coyote that you are trying to get. Um, so it's very difficult, but you know there are some experienced trappers that can do this. Uh, typically, these, these trappers will charge a community several thousand dollars to come out and remove a coyote or a couple of problem coyotes. They will spend several weeks doing reconnaissance work, using trail cameras, uh, following the coyote, learning its patterns, putting out the trap, pre-baiting the trap, all of those things. So let's say that they do effectively remove the problem coyote. Well, then what? Uh, you know, another coyote is going to come right in and fill the space. Uh, you might have more reproduction going on. Um, but more importantly, you haven't addressed the root cause of conflicts. Um, the Cook County Coyote Project, out of all of the thousand coyotes that they've radio collared, I think only five have been deemed nuisance coyotes. And three of those were because they were sick. They had mange and they were just seen sort of hanging around eating pet food. Only two of those have ever attacked pets. You know, so 99% so essentially, or more, coyotes usually are not causing problems with people and pets. It's only a very small number. Um, and almost always, the reason that problem coyotes become problem coyotes is because they are either getting free, easy sources of food, pet food or garbage left outside, or because there are unattended pets roaming around. So if we remove this problem coyote, um, but we leave those problematic uh, problems, we're often just, the new coyote coming in can very well become a problem coyote too. So when we do this, we haven't, uh, we haven't gotten to the root cause of the conflicts. You know, we haven't taught ourselves anything. We might, we're gonna get stuck in this loop of just removing problem coyotes over and over again. But maybe even more importantly, we haven't taught coyotes anything. So this coyote that was attacking pets, you know, if, if you have successfully caught him, which as I mentioned is very difficult to do, but if you do, and you remove him and, you know, he's gone. But, you know, so he's dead. But the other coyotes in his family group don't know why this coyote is dead. As I mentioned, coyotes are very social. So they probably learn from this other coyote. They might be attacking pets too. They might be coming into neighborhoods too. They probably are. They don't realize that this coyote is dead because he was attacking pets. They haven't learned anything, in other words. Um, so you haven't taught these coyotes anything. You're going to get new coyotes coming in. You're just going to keep having this cycle of problems continue. So what do we do? What is another way? Well, that's where we get to hazing. So hazing is a way of teaching coyotes. It is a way of catching them in the act. You know, sort of like if you've ever trained a dog, I'm still raising a puppy, so I know a lot about this. You know, you have to catch them in the act of doing something and either reward them or, you know, or teach them that that's not the right thing to do. And then you can actually retrain the coyotes that live in your neighborhood. You know, no matter how many coyotes we remove, there are always going to be coyotes around. So the best thing to do is to teach the coyotes that live in your neighborhood that you already see and interact with and teach them what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. So I'm gonna show you now a video. Uh, this is by the city of Aurora, Colorado. And you might have to bear with us a moment as we get this going. But um, this will tell you all about how to haze a coyote, what it means, and how to do it. Coyotes are all around us. Not just in the wild, but also in neighborhoods, cities, and suburbs. And even if you've never seen one, you should still know what to do just in case you come across one. Don't know what to do? Welcome to our instructional video on how to haze a coyote. In this video, we're going to show you how to haze a coyote. Let's talk about what hazing is first. Hazing is a simple thing that you can do if you're suddenly approached by a coyote, or if you see one somewhere in an area where it doesn't belong. Hazing keeps your community safe and protects you and the animal from harm. Everybody wins. When we think of coyotes, we tend to think of this, or even this. But coyotes are actually a bit more like this, and they're coming into contact with people in urban areas more and more, so it's important we know more about them. Here are some coyote facts to consider. 
No matter how big you think a coyote looks, most coyotes actually weigh less than 45 pounds. They're mostly skin and fur and legs, and really very little actual coyote. What do coyotes eat? Human beings are rarely on a coyote's shopping list. They mostly like to eat fruits, insects, snakes, squirrels, mice, goose eggs, and other things that actually make them helpful to our ecosystem. For the most part, coyotes avoid people. We're loud, stinky, and kind of scary. Hey! Woo! And in places where coyotes come into contact with humans all the time, they could get used to us and no longer see us as something to avoid. And this is especially true for urban coyotes. Luckily, coyotes are generally trainable. And this is where you come in. Like it or not, you help train your local coyotes by how you interact with them every time you see them. So, what is hazing? I know what hazing is. We did it in my fraternity. All we need are some wigs, some lipstick, and a few goats. No, 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 not that kind of hazing. Hello, I am the Dog Whisperer, Caesar Milan. We teach hazing to all of my clients at the Dog Psychology Center I have in Los Angeles, California. Yeah, not quite. See, hazing is probably something you already know how to do. You probably use hazing techniques to keep your pet off the furniture or out of certain areas of your house. Buster, what are you doing on that chair? Get off it there. Thank you. So what happens if you run into a coyote? Who does the hazing? A ranger? Well, that would be nice, but if you're in an urban area like a supermarket parking lot, there probably aren't going to be a whole lot of rangers around to help you. How about this person? Surely she can help. All right, sweetie. Well, I just finished folding your underwear, and I packed you a PB&J with the crust cut off. Would you like me to go out and haze that coyote for you before you go? Sorry, but Mom is not going to be able to help you either. How about a firefighter, or a policeman, or a superhero, or an astronaut? You get the idea by now. No one is going to haze a coyote for you. If you encounter a coyote, you're going to need to handle it yourself. But here's the good news. It's not that difficult. So, what does hazing look like? In order to understand what hazing is, let's first see some examples of what hazing is not. No, that's not hazing. Well, that's scary, but that's not hazing either. Go away now. Go on. Go away. Nope, that's not hazing either. Hey, it's a coyote! Hey, everybody, it's a coyote! Come here, come here, come here! No, that's not hazing either. In fact, that's just stupid. Go away, coyote! Go away! A talking shrub isn't hazing either. So running, hiding, or even trying to be friendly to the animal, these are all things that you should not do. So what does coyote hazing look like? Well, remember the acronym SMART. Stop. Make. Announce. Repeat and teach. Stop. Make yourself look big. Hey! Announce yourself. Hey, hey, hey! Repeat if necessary, and teach someone else in your community about coyote hazing. If you have a pet with you, bring it closer to you, or if possible, into your arms. Next, what should I say when I haze? Remember, when it comes to hazing a coyote, it's not what you say, but how you say it. You freak, you freak, you freak, freak, freak. Yes, that's fine. That will work. It might be a little R-rated, but it will get results, which is ultimately what you want. Go on now. Shoo. Once again, it's not what you say, but how you say it. Give it a little gusto. Go on. Get out of here. Go. That's more like it. Sure, whatever you say doesn't matter, so it can even be gibberish. The only thing that matters is that it's a human voice, it's forceful, and directed at the coyote. Many people ask, can I use objects when I'm hazing a coyote? Sure, there's a lot of things you can use to make yourself look larger or make more noise, such as a rake, 
a golf club, pennies in a can, an air horn, a stick, even a water gun would work. The things you don't want to use are things like food, a lemon meringue pie, steak, anything that might coax the coyote near you. Just remember, the goal with hazing the coyote is not to harm it, but rather to teach it to avoid people and specific places. Next, when should I haze? Hazing a coyote should take place anytime a coyote engages you, approaches you, or you see one where it doesn't belong, such as a backyard, a playground, or just strolling down the sidewalk in the middle of the day. So, what's your excuse for not hazing? Many people don't feel comfortable with the idea of hazing a coyote. Here are some common excuses and reasons why you shouldn't make them. Well, I don't want to look like an idiot. Do you really want coyotes hanging around your house or your neighborhood? If not, you might want to be willing to look a little silly. Besides, it's only going to be for a few seconds. What if it gets mad and comes after me? Don't worry, it's only a 30 pound canine. You're probably going to be able to scare it off just fine. I don't know what to do. That's why we've made this video. This isn't something they teach you in school. Well, I don't think it will work. It will work. If you follow all the instructions we just gave you, you'll be fine. The coyote is my totem animal, and so we're in a spiritual journey together, and I don't want to hurt the coyote's feelings. Next, is there any time I shouldn't haze a coyote? This is actually a very good question. There is one exception. Never haze a coyote that is cornered, injured, or with pups. In these cases, simply make yourself look larger, maintain eye contact, and slowly back away. So now you know how to do this, and you're prepared. And you can also share this information with friends and family, so that they are also prepared. So that's how you haze a coyote. Be smart. Coyote Safety and Awareness Education is funded in part by Adams County Open Space and the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District. For more information on coyote safety and awareness, please visit auroragov.org nature. Now that you know how to haze a coyote, I will just give you a few extra tips to go along with that. Uh, so one of the, there are a number of great things about hazing, and one of the best parts about it is that anyone can haze a coyote at any time. Every single person in this room can haze a coyote. You don't need to be an animal control officer or a wildlife biologist. Every single person in this room can and should haze a coyote. Uh, you can do it anytime. The, the easiest way is just to put your arms over your head and yell at the coyote, um, but it's more fun to use props, of course. Uh, my personal favorite is the little air horn, which I won't, I won't do here, but it's quite loud. You can get these at, at party supply stores. You can use a whistle, so that's something easy that you can do. You can just put it around your neck while you're going and walking your dog, and if you see a coyote, blow the whistle at it. You can make your own hazing tools. So this is just a sippy cup with pennies in it, but it's nice and loud. You can bang pots and pans, you can open up an umbrella. If you're outside in your yard, you can use a water hose on the coyote. Uh, the squirt guns, especially the long range ones, those are great also, squirting water at the coyote. You know, there's a number of ways that you can do it. And one of the other great things about hazing is that when you haze one coyote, you are actually sending a message to the whole group. So as I was talking about before, coyotes learn from each other. So if you have seen, for example, one coyote in your neighborhood and now you're seeing two or three, um, if you start hazing them, you'll see that in reverse. You'll start to see less and less coyotes until you don't see them at all anymore. So just a few important rules to do hazing correctly. Number one is that you have to make sure that you have a direct connection with the coyote for it to work. Uh, there were some animal control officers in Los Angeles who were using paintball guns to haze coyotes. Um, however, they were hiding behind bushes while they were doing it. So the coyotes were getting hit with paintballs, but they didn't know where they were coming from. And that didn't work. So the coyote needs to see you and know that you're hazing them. 
Uh, so, you know, honking your car horn doesn't work either. They hear traffic noise all the time. You know, they're not going to, to understand that. So just make sure you have a direct connection with the coyote. You can make eye contact with them, um, certainly. As the video mentioned, if you're with a small pet or child, pick them up. Um, or if it's a larger pet or child, you know, sort of bring them in close to you and behind you if you can. That way you can get the coyote to focus on you so that you can scare them away. Now, the most important rule, um, and this is where a lot of people unknowingly go wrong when they haze a coyote, is that you must continue hazing the coyote until they run away. So what I hear a lot of times from people um, when they first haze a coyote is that, you know, they yell and wave their arms at the coyote and the coyote just stands there and looks at them. Or maybe the coyote runs away 20 or 30 feet and then just stands there and looks at them. And the reason this is happening is that the coyote has usually has never been hazed before. At this point, they're usually very habituated. They're not really afraid of people too much. And essentially, they're just testing you and trying to figure out what you're doing and what happens next. So if you yell your arms and wave at them for a couple seconds and then stop, the coyote learns that they all they have to do is wait a few moments, you'll stop, they can go right back to whatever they were doing before. Um, or they might, you know, again, they might run away a bit and they learn they just have to wait and then go right back to whatever they were doing before. So what we recommend is that you intensify their, your hazing and continue doing it until they run away. So the easiest way to do that is actually to run towards the coyote while you're yelling and waving your arms and the coyote will run away. So I see a couple faces in the audience. Um, some of you will not be comfortable doing that and that's fine. Um, I will say that coyotes are really hardwired to run away from a threat. You know, that's sort of, like I said, they have those long legs, they're really fast, you know, they're actually not, they're they're not really meant to, they're not built to fight, they're built to run. So, and when they're faced with a threat, they're going to run away. So they're not going to come after you if you run towards them. However, if you're not comfortable with that, that's perfectly fine. You just want to continue hazing and intensify it until they run away. And they will, they will run away. Um, a variety of, of methods is important. So, you know, a lot of people ask me what's the best tool to use, that doesn't really matter. Um, but if everybody in Groton is, is whistling at coyotes all the time, they might start to learn that's not really a threat. So we do want a little bit of variety in how we haze, but more importantly is a variety of people doing the hazing. So the reason I'm here today talking to you all and not just to animal control officers is because if we just were to you know, have animal control officers or police haze coyotes, coyotes are going to learn very quickly what animal control and police officers look like. They're going to learn their uniform, they're going to learn their car uh, or truck, and before the officer can even get out of their car, um, the coyotes are going to be long gone. Um, and they'll be afraid of police and animal control officers, but they're not going to be afraid of you all who interact with coyotes all the time. So that's why we need everyone to haze coyotes so that they learn very quickly um, that all people are scary and should be avoided. Uh, you only want to use these noisemakers or do the hazing when you actually have a connection with the coyote. And this might sound like a lot of work, but the good news is only two to three times is needed to really change the behavior of coyotes or a whole family group. So as the video mentioned, you never want to haze a sick or injured coyote or corner them. You want to make sure they have an escape route. And in terms of kids, they can use all of these techniques. We wouldn't encourage them to run towards the coyote, but they can definitely be big and loud, big noisemakers, and then they can back away. Okay, so just a couple quick examples um, before I have time for questions here. Um, these are some real world examples where hazing ha was used to change the behavior of problematic coyotes. So this was a, a park uh, called Bible Park in the Denver, Colorado area. They had a group of coyotes that were attacking pets. They were following runners. They were um, just lounging in the park like this, uh, right around people in the broad daylight with no concerns. So this is a situation where a lot of communities probably would have closed down the park and put out traps to catch the coyotes. But they had done that in Denver before several times and hadn't found it effective. So they decided instead to try hazing. Um, actually, the first thing they did was look around and try to figure out why is this happening in the first place. And they realized they had a trash issue, which they took care of, and they realized there were some people in the park feeding coyotes. So they put an end to that, they put out signs, they got better trash cans, they went around and talked to park goers, but they also, every morning for three weeks, went out and hazed the coyotes with pots and pans, whistles, air horns, all those sorts of things. And within three weeks, this behavior had completely stopped. 
the, you know, none of this aggressive behavior, no more attacks on pets, um, no more following people. In fact, the people who visited the park started making angry phone calls to the city, you know, wanting to know what did they do with the coyotes. And the truth is that the coyotes are still there. You know, when we haze coyotes, we're not sending them over to the next town. They're still going to live in their home range. They're just going to change their behavior. They're be going to become more nocturnal and change their behavior to avoid us. Another example, this is, um, could be like any of you here in the audience. It was a, a man who had a little small dog and he had been seeing a coyote in his neighborhood and he was concerned about it. So he attended a session like this, learned how to haze. He went home and a few evenings later, he was about to let his dog outside, but he looked, he looked outside first and saw a coyote um, across the street in his neighbor's driveway. So he said, okay, he, you know, he kept his dog inside. He said, I'll try this hazing thing. Stepped outside, you know, opened his front door, stepped onto his front porch, started yelling and waving his arms, um, and the coyote just stood there and looked at him. And so he said, okay, you know, they talked about this. I need to intensify my hazing. So he kept yelling and waving his arms and he ran towards the coyote. He actually got within six feet of the coyote before the coyote took off and ran away. But then he did, he ran away. Uh, a few evenings later, he saw the coyote again. This time he opened up his front door, stepped onto his porch, started yelling and waving his arms. This time, as soon as he started yelling, the coyote took off and ran away. The third time he saw the coyote, all he did was open up his front door and the coyote took off. And that was the last time he ever saw the coyote. Uh, this is a pretty typical story that we hear. Um, the first time, he had to do more work. Um, and no, you don't have to get within six feet of a coyote. You can do other things. Um, the important thing is that he persisted. Uh, the next time it was easier. Third time, almost no effort at all. And that's really all that it took. And if his neighbors had been helping, it probably would have been even easier. Uh, last example, this was a, a elementary school in the Denver area where coyotes had been seen around the school. Um, they were also seen peering through the fence uh, to the kids at recess. So obviously this looked very menacing uh, to the parents and the school staff. And this is another uh, situation where a lot of schools probably would have closed down the school and put out traps. Um, However, they just, again, the city had done this many times with, you know, no success really. So the first thing they did is did some reconnaissance work, which is what I always recommend. And what they found out was that the kids had been feeding the coyotes through the fence at recess. So that explains that behavior. So they put an end to that. They taught the kids about coyotes. Um, and then they got the school staff and the parents involved, and they started hazing the coyotes in the neighborhood. So this was 2009, and this was effective, and they've had no problems since then. So just in summary, those of you that have seen a coyote, I imagine you'll see one again. So what will you do? Number one, remember, it's normal to see them during the daytime, but if they don't run away from you, you definitely should haze them. Haze them with any of these techniques uh, that we talked about today. Uh, and then after you haze them, you always want to stop and say, why did this happen? Um, is there something in my yard that attracted them? Is there something in my neighbor's yards? You know, go and nicely talk to your neighbors and teach them how to haze too. So in conclusion, we do have to change some of our behaviors to prevent coyote conflicts. We do have to change coyote behaviors, and the best way to do that is through hazing, because if we remove them, there will always be more that take their place. So the best thing to do is teach our neighborhood coyotes uh, what they can't, what is and is not acceptable. Um, and we do all have to work together, so I hope that you'll share this information with your family and your friends. Thank you all for coming.